Hi, my name is Paul Sargent. Welcome once again to AP Euro Bit by Bit, in which I'm trying to break up modern European history into little bite-sized pieces so that you can better understand it. Today's topic, Christian Humanism. Let's take a look. So in our last video, I introduced you to the Reformation, the Protestant Reformation to be more specific, and talked about sort of the basic idea behind this whole thing. The premise for the Protestant Reformation comes from Christian Humanism develops in the North during the Renaissance. So it's got a lot of different names. It's called Northern Renaissance Humanism, it's called Christian Renaissance Humanism, sometimes Christian Humanism, or Northern Humanism. Any one of them, they all mean the same thing. What it means is a few things. All right, so what was Christian Humanism? Well, we can really say that it consisted of three major things. Number one, Christian humanists were concerned with an education and knowledge of the classics, just like Italian humanists were. Number two, Northern or Christian humanists were preoccupied with religion. And so, so rather than translating the works of Greek writers, they translated the Bible and the writings of early Christian writers like St. Augustine and St. Jerome. When they translated these works, they discovered a simpler Christianity, very unlike the Catholicism which was being practiced in the 16th century. And number three, they pushed for a program of reform. They really believed that education in the classics would create an inner piety in front, for people. And that would lead people to call for reform and change within the church. And to put this into action, they did a few things. They supported schools, they translated the Bibles and the works of the church fathers into vernacular languages, the languages being used by the people. And this is summarized up in Erasmus's introduction he wrote to his translation of the New Testament. In it he wrote about the scriptures, would that as a result the farmer sing some portion of them at the plow, the weaver hum some parts of them to the movement of his shuttle, the traveler lighten the weariness of his journey with stories of this kind. In other words, they wanted everyone to have access to scripture and be able to, to talk about and know scripture. That's what they thought was going to make the change. Their major hope was that education would bring about societal reform and make the lives of people, well, better. So let's take a look at the two most influential Christian humanists, Desiderius Erasmus and Thomas More. So Desiderius Erasmus is like the chief Christian humanists, all right? He really viewed Christianity more as a philosophy rather than a set of beliefs and practices. And he thought that Christianity had a message for how to live life and how to make society. And it wasn't about doing all of the actions that the church did. It wasn't about uh, going to church a certain number of times. It wasn't about those sorts of things. It was about a general world view. And so it made him question the very nature of religion itself. He also felt that people needed to develop this inner piety through the reading of the scripture. And when he looked at the Vulgate Bible, which had been translated by St. Jerome centuries before and was the official Bible of the Catholic Church, he found errors in the translation. And so he created his own translation of the New Testament using the earliest available Greek text and published it in Latin in 1516. His most famous work was called In Praise of Folly, which was published in 1509. And in it, he criticized the abuses of the Catholic Church. He used satire to make this point, and the book is really still funny today. In part of it, he says, those that are closest to the theologians in happiness are generally called the religious or monks, both of which are deceiving names, since for the most part, they stay as far away from religion as possible. So you can see the humor that he tries to pull into this thing while still criticizing the Catholic Church. Now, it's often said by people that Erasmus laid the egg that Luther hatched. In other words, he put those ideas out there that Luther would eventually turn into the Protestant Reformation. But let it be known that he did not approve of the Protestant Reformation. He, what he wanted was a reform within the church, not the division of the church, and certainly not the division of the church that ended up happening. Secondly, Thomas More. Well, Thomas More was an Englishman who was also very educated in the classical languages of Greek and Latin, but he also brought that Italian idea of service to the state. 
and so he got into politics and eventually worked his way up to be Lord Chancellor of England under Henry VIII, which would eventually lead to his execution for publicly and privately going against Henry VIII's decision to break with the Catholic Church. He was also a good friend of Erasmus. His most famous work was Utopia, published in 1516, which presented an idealistic view of a society, a perfect society. In this society, cooperation and reason were valued over competition. There was communal ownership of everything rather than private property. Everyone worked nine hours a day and everyone got rewarded only what they needed. Because of taking away the value of money, property, and status, they ended up with a society where people were able to live a more wholesome and enriching life, which is really that societal reform that the Northern Renaissance is calling for. So he didn't just write about ideas, he actually tried to put them into, into action. And as I said, he worked under Henry VIII. He said in his introduction to Utopia that things will never be perfect until human beings are perfect, which I don't expect them to be for a number of years. As I said before, his strong religious beliefs brought him into conflict with Henry VIII when Henry decided to break from the Catholic Church, and I'll tell you that story in a few episodes. But he ultimately, Thomas More, was executed for his beliefs. He just chose that over going along with the break from the Church. Why are the Christian humanists so important? Well, if you look at the ideas and the actions of guys like Erasmus and more, what you see is they did really two things. Number one, they created the intellectual foundation for what would become the Protestant Reformation. Number two, by emphasizing education, they brought the ideas of scripture and the church fathers to be more accessible to the people as a whole. And that's what's so absolutely revolutionary about this movement. What they're saying is that the church, which is the most powerful force in Europe, if not arguably the most powerful force in the world, can be questioned by people if they simply read the text of the Bible itself. It's a revolutionary idea with moderate aims. What you'll find throughout European history is that moderate aims very quickly become radical. So as I've said before, in Europe there's always an idea before there's an action. And next time we're going to get into the action that started the Protestant Reformation. But for now, that's Christian humanism, and I hope you understand it. If you like what you see, please click subscribe so that you can be notified when I post new videos. And as always, my name is Paul Sargent. This is AP Euro Bit by Bit. Thanks for watching.